pure joys, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. It is a great honor to be back in Ebenezer Baptist Church in the pulpit of its greatest pastor, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., to pay my respects to perhaps his finest disciple, an American whose faith was tested again and again to produce a man of pure joy and unbreakable perseverance. John Robert Lewis. To those who have spoken, to Presidents Bush and Clinton, Madam Speaker, Reverend Warnock, Reverend King, John's family, friends, his beloved staff, Mayor Bottoms, I've come here today because I, like so many Americans, owe a great debt to John Lewis and his forceful vision of freedom. You know, this country is a constant work in progress. We're born with instructions to form a more perfect union. Explicit in those words is the idea that we're imperfect, that what gives each new generation purpose is to take up the unfinished work of the last and carry it further than any might have thought possible. John Lewis, first of the Freedom Riders, head of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, youngest speaker at the March on Washington, leader of the march from Selma to Montgomery, member of Congress representing the people of this state and this district for 33 years, mentor to young people, including me at the time, until his final day on this earth, he not only embraced that responsibility, but he made it his life's work, which isn't bad for a boy from Troy. John was born into modest means. That means he was poor. <laughs> In the heart of the Jim Crow South, to parents who picked somebody else's cotton. Apparently, he didn't take to farm work. On days when he was supposed to help his brothers and sisters with their labor, he'd hide under the porch and make a break for the school bus when it showed up. His mother, Willie Mae Lewis, nurtured that curiosity in this shy, serious child. Once you learn something, she told her son, once you get something inside your head, no one can take it away from you. As a boy, John listened through the door after bedtime. His father's friends complained about the claim. One Sunday, as a teenager, he heard Dr. King preach on the radio. As a college student in Tennessee, he signed up 
for Jim Lawson's workshops on the tactic of nonviolent civil disobedience. John Lewis was getting something inside his head, an idea he couldn't shake, took hold of him, that nonviolent resistance and civil disobedience were the means to change laws, but also change hearts and change minds and change nations and change the world. So he helped organize the Nashville campaign in 1960. He and other young men and women sat at a segregated lunch camp, well-dressed, straight back, refusing to let a milkshake poured on their heads or a cigarette extinguished on their backs or a foot aimed at their ribs refused to let that dent their dignity and their sense of purpose. And after a few months, the Nashville campaign achieved the first successful desegregation of public facilities in any major city in the South. John got a taste of jail for the first, second, third, well, several times. <laughs> but he also got a taste of victory, and it consumed him with righteous purpose. And he took the battle deeper into the South. And that same year, just weeks after the Supreme Court ruled that segregation of interstate bus facilities was unconstitutional, John and Bernard Lafayette bought two tickets, climbed aboard a Greyhound, sat up front, and refused to move. This was months before the first official freedom riots. He was doing a, a test. <laughs> Trip was unsanctioned. Few knew what they were up to. And at every stop through the night, apparently, the angry driver stormed out of the bus and into the bus station. And John and Bernard had no idea what he might come back with or who he might come back with. Nobody was there to protect them. There were no camera crews to record events. We, you know, sometimes, Rev, we, we read about this and we kind of take it for granted. Or at least we, we, we act as if it was inevitable. I, imagine the courage of two people Malia's age younger than my oldest daughter, on their own, to challenge an entire infrastructure of oppression. John was only 20 years old, but he pushed all 20 of those years to the center of the table, betting everything, all of it that his example could challenge centuries of convention and generations of brutal violence and countless daily indignities suffered by African Americans. Like John the Baptist preparing the way. Like those Old Testament prophets speaking truth to kings. John Lewis did not hesitate, and he kept on getting on board buses and sitting at lunch counters, got his mugshot taken again and again, marched again and again on a mission to change America. Spoke to a 
quarter million people at the March on Washington when he was just 23. Helped organize the Freedom Summer in Mississippi when he was just 24. At the ripe old age of 25, John was asked to lead the march from Selma to Montgomery. He was warned that Governor Wallace had ordered troopers to use violence. But he and Jose Williams and others led them across that bridge anyway. And we've all seen the film and the footage and the photographs. President Clinton mentioned the trench coat, the knapsack, the book to read, the apple to eat, the toothbrush. Apparently, uh, jails weren't big on such creature comforts. And you look at those pictures, and, and John looks so young, and, and he's small in stature, looking every bit that shy, serious child that his mother had raised, and yet he's full of purpose. God's put perseverance in it. And we know what happened to the marchers that day. Their bones were cracked by billy clubs. Their eyes and lungs choked with tear gas. They knelt to pray, which made their heads easier targets. And John was struck in the skull. And he thought he was going to die. Surrounded by the sight of young Americans gagging and bleeding and trampled. Victims in their own country of state-sponsored violence. And the thing is, I imagine initially that day, the troopers thought they'd won the battle. You can imagine the conversations they had afterwards. You can imagine them saying, yeah, we showed them. They figured they'd turn the protesters back over the bridge, that they'd kept, that they'd preserved a system that denied the basic humanity of their fellow citizens. Except this time there were some cameras there. This time the world saw what happened, bore witness to black Americans who were asking for nothing more than to be treated like other Americans, who were not asking for special treatment, just equal treatment, promised to them a century before, and almost another century before that. And when John woke up and checked himself out of the hospital, he would make sure the world saw a movement that was in the words of Scripture, hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. They so returned to Brown Chapel, a battered prophet, bandages around his head. And he said, more marchers will come now. And the people came. And the troopers parted. And the marchers reached Montgomery. And their words 
reached the White House. And Lyndon Johnson, son of the South, said, we shall overcome. And the Voting Rights Act was signed into law. The life of John Lewis was, in so many ways, exceptional. It vindicated the faith in our founding, redeemed that faith. That most American of ideas, the idea that any of us, ordinary people without rank or wealth or title or fame, can somehow point out the imperfections of this nation and come together and challenge the status quo and decide that it is in our power to remake this country that we love until it more closely aligns with our highest ideals. What a radical idea. What a revolutionary notion, this idea that any of us, ordinary people, a young kid from Troy, can stand up to the powers and principalities and say, no, this isn't right, this isn't true, this isn't just. We can do better. On the battlefield of justice, Americans like John, Americans like Reverend Lowry and C.T. Vivian, two other patriots that we lost this year, liberated all of us, that many Americans came to take for granted. America was built by people like them. America was built by John Lewis's. He, as much as anyone in our history, brought this country a little bit closer to our highest ideals. And someday when we do finish that long journey towards freedom, when we do form a more perfect union, whether it's years from now or decades or even if it takes another two centuries, John Lewis will be a founding father of that fuller, fairer, better America. And yet, as exceptional as John was, Here's the thing, John never believed that what he did was more than any citizen of this country can do. I, I mentioned in the statement the day John passed, the thing about John was just how gentle and, and humble he was. And Despite this storied, remarkable career, he treated everyone with kindness and respect because it was innate to him, this idea that any of us can do what he did. If we're willing to persevere. He believed that in all of us, there exists the capacity for great courage. That in all of us, there's a longing to do what's right. That in all of us, there's a willingness to love all people and to extend to them their God-given rights to dignity and respect. So many of us lose that sense. It's taught out of us. 
we, we, we start feeling as if, in fact, we can't afford to extend kindness or decency to other people, that we're better off if we're above other people and looking down on them. And so often that's encouraged in our culture. But John always said, he, he always saw the best in us. And he never gave up and never stopped speaking out because he saw the best in us. He believed in us even when we didn't believe in ourselves. And as a congressman, he didn't arrest. He kept getting himself arrested. As an old man, he didn't sit out any fight. Sat in all night long on the floor of the United States Capitol. I know his staff was stressed. But the testing of his faith produced perseverance. He knew that the march is not over, that the race is not yet won, that we have not yet reached that blessed destination where we are judged by the content of our character. He knew from his own life that progress is fragile, that we have to be vigilant against the dark occurrence of this country's history, of our own history, with their whirlpools of violence and hatred and despair that can always rise again. Bull Connor may be gone, but today we witness with our own eyes police officers kneeling on the necks of black Americans. George Wallace may be gone, but we can witness our federal government sending agents to use tear gas and batons against peaceful demonstrators. We may no longer have to guess the number of jelly beans in a jar in order to cast a ballot. But even as we sit here, there are those in power who are doing their darndest to discourage people from voting by closing polling locations and targeting minorities and students with restrictive ID laws and attacking our voting rights with surgical precision, even undermining the Postal Service in the run-up to an election that's going to be dependent on mail-in ballots so people don't get sick. Now, I know this is a celebration of John's life. There are some who might say we shouldn't dwell on such things. But that's why I'm talking about it. John Lewis devoted his time on this earth fighting the very attacks on democracy and what's best in America that we're, we're seeing circulate right now. He knew that every single one of us has a God-given power and that the fate of this democracy depends on how we use it, that democracy isn't automatic. It has to be nurtured. It has to be tended to. We have to work at it. It's hard. And so he knew that it depends on whether we summon a measure, just a measure of John's moral courage to question what's right and what's wrong and call things as they are. He said that as long as he had a breath in his body, he would do everything he could to preserve this democracy. And as long as we have breath in our bodies, 
We have to continue his cause. If we want our children to grow up in a democracy, not just with elections, but a true democracy, a representative democracy, in a big, hearted, tolerant, vibrant, inclusive America of perpetual self-creation, then we're going to have to be more like John. We don't have to do all the things he had to do because he did them for us, but we got to do something. As the Lord instructed Paul, do not be afraid. Go on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. It's just everybody's got to come out and vote. We got, we got all those people in the city, but they can't do nothing. Like John, we've got to keep getting into that good trouble. He knew that nonviolent protest is patriotic, a way to raise public awareness and put a spotlight on injustice and make the powers that be uncomfortable. Like John, we don't have to choose between protests and politics. It's not an either-or situation. It's a both-and situation. We have to engage in protests where that's effective, but we also have to translate our passion and our causes into laws, instant institutional practices. That's why John ran for Congress 34 years ago. Like John, we've got to fight even harder for the most powerful tool that we have, which is the right to vote. The Voting Rights Act is one of the crowning achievements of our democracy. That's why John crossed that bridge. That's why he spilled his blood. And by the way, it was the result of Democratic and Republican efforts. President Bush, who spoke here earlier, and his father signed its renewal when they were in office. President Clinton didn't have to because it was the law when he arrived, so instead he made a law to make it easier for people to register to vote. But once the Supreme Court weakened the Voting Rights Act, some state legislators unleashed a flood of laws designed specifically to make voting harder, especially, by the way, state legislators where there's a lot of minority turnout and population growth. That's not necessarily a mystery or an accident. It was an attack on what John fought for. It was an attack on our democratic freedoms. And we should treat it as such. If politicians want to honor John, and, and, and I'm so grateful for the legacy and work of all the congressional leaders who are here, but th th there's a better way than a statement calling him a hero. Right. You want to honor John? Let's honor him by revitalizing the law that he was willing to die for. Right. And by the way, naming it the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, that is a fine tribute. But John wouldn't want us to stop there, just trying to get back to where we already were. Once we pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, we should keep marching.
to make it even better by making sure every American is automatically registered to vote, including former inmates who've earned their second chance. By adding polling places and expanding early voting and making Election Day a national holiday. So if you are somebody who's working in a factory or you're a single mom who's got to go to her job and doesn't get time off, you can still cast your ballot by guaranteeing that every American citizen has equal representation in our government, including the American citizens who live in Washington, D.C. and in Puerto Rico. They're Americans. By ending some of the partisan gerrymandering so that all voters have the power to choose their politicians, not the other way around. And if all this takes eliminating the filibuster, another Jim Crow relic, in order to secure the God-given rights of every American, then that's what we should do. Now, even if we do all this, even if every bogus voter suppression law is struck off the books today, We've got to be honest with ourselves that too many of us choose not to exercise the franchise. Too many of our citizens believe their vote won't make a difference, or they buy into the cynicism that, by the way, is the central strategy of voter suppression, to make you discouraged, to stop believing in your own power. So we're also going to have to remember what John said. If you don't do everything you can do to change things, then they will remain the same. You only pass this way once. You have to give it all you have. As long as young people are protesting in the streets, hoping real change takes hold, I'm hopeful, but we can't casually abandon them at the ballot box, not when few elections have been as urgent on so many levels as this one. We can't treat voting as an errand to run if we have some time. We have to treat it as the most important action we can take on behalf of democracy. And like John, we have to give it all we have. I was proud that John Lewis was a friend of mine. I met him when I was in law school. He came to speak. And I went up and I said, Mr. Lewis, you are one of my heroes. What inspired me more than anything as a young man was to see what you and Reverend Lawson, Bob Moses, and Diane Nash, and others did. And he got that kind of, all oh, shucks, thank you very much. <laughs> Next time I saw him, I'd been elected to the United States Senate. And I told him, John, you, I'm here because of you. And on Inauguration Day in 2008, 2009, um, he was one of the first people I greeted and hugged on that stand. And I told him, this is your day, too. He was a good and kind and gentle man. And he believed in us, even when we don't believe in ourselves. 
And it's fitting that the last time John and I shared a public forum was on Zoom. And I'm pretty sure neither he nor I set up the Zoom call because we didn't know how to work it. There's a virtual town hall with a gathering of young activists who had been helping to lead this summer's demonstrations in the wake of George Floyd's, uh, George Floyd's death. And afterwards, I spoke to John privately, and he could not have been prouder to see this new generation of activists standing up for freedom and equality, a new generation that was intent on voting and protecting the right to vote, uh, in some cases, a new generation running for political office. And I, I told him, all those young people, John, of every race and every religion, from every background and gender and sexual orientation, John, those are your children. They learned from your example, even if they didn't always know it. They had understood through him what American citizenship requires, even if they'd only heard about his courage through the history books. By the thousands, faceless, anonymous, relentless young people, black and white, have taken our whole nation back to those great wells of democracy which were dug deep by the Founding Fathers in the formulation of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Dr. King said that in the 1960s, and it came true again this summer. We see it outside our windows in big cities and rural towns, in men and women, young and old, straight Americans and LGBTQ Americans, blacks who long for equal treatment and whites who can no longer accept freedom for themselves while witnessing the subjugation of their fellow Americans. We see it in everybody doing the hard work of overcoming complacency, of overcoming our own fears and our own prejudices, our own hatreds. You see it in, in people trying to be better, truer versions of ourselves. And that's what John Lewis teaches us. That's where real courage comes from, not from turning on each other, but by turning towards one another, not by sowing hatred and division, but by spreading love and truth, not by avoiding our responsibilities to create a better America and a better world but by embracing those responsibilities with joy and perseverance and discovering that in our beloved community, we do not walk alone. What a gift John Lewis was. We are all so lucky to have had him walk with us for a while and show us the way. God bless you all. God bless America. God bless this gentle soul who pulled it closer to its promise. Thank you very much. All right, guys, I do apologize for that. But today's date is August the 1st, 2020, and this is how the frack we got here. I'm your host, the most William Buchanan, on how the frack we got here. We do take the events of the week and try to make sense out of it all. Um, before I do get started, this is an adult podcast, so some language will be limited. Um, as we're trying to not cuss so much, but unfortunately, we can't do anything about the uh, video. Sometimes it can be graphic, so viewer discretion is advised. But aside from that, welcome. 
Now, I just wanted to show that that was basically, uh, for all those who watched and still kept watching, thank you, that was uh, former President Obama giving the eulogy at a Representative John Lewis his funeral. And uh, be honest, which I don't know about y'all, but whenever President Obama is speaking, I feel instantly better because Dorito is fucking up. <laughs> well, we know Dorito's been fucking up, but let's just be honest, he's been fucking up. That being said, guys, um, hopefully you guys are having a wonderful weekend in this wonderful world we call 2020, which is basically Jumanji, um, or I call 2020 the year of hold my beer. But um, as we get into it, guys, there is some bad news and some good news, and then there's just some, you know, what the fuck. Um, let's just start with the economy, how we're doing on that. Second quarter GDP fell 32.9 percent as most of the country shuts down to deal with the COVID-19 epidemic. ABC News business correspondent Deirdre Bolton is here live with us with more. Deirdre, is this all largely due to the shutdown because of the pandemic or are there more factors at play here? Well, the pandemic really is the biggest reason, Diana, and you stated it. This is a backwards looking number. So this second quarter number, and it is clearly the worst on record, not to understate that. But this is for April, May and June. And as you know, our economy was ground to a halt 100 percent in April. So we did see some signs of life in May and June, but not enough to compensate for that complete and sh total shutdown for the month of April. Consumer consumption, what we are all spending. This is two thirds of our economic activity. What we normally spend in restaurants, in bars, travel, on clothes, all of that adds up to be a significant portion. And not surprisingly, with the pandemic, with those lockdown orders, consumers really just stopped. So we saw that, that's what we're getting. This is our report card, as you well know. It's the broadest measure of all goods and services, and it is showing for the month of April, collectively, we stopped. Diane. And, and not necessarily a huge surprise there since it was the plan for pretty much everything to stop for April. But the big question is, do we come back from this? How do we come back from this? How quickly do we come back with this? What's the realistic view on that? Well, I think there are a lot of questions there. And most economists tell me the virus is the economy. The economy is the virus. We have 21 states that the federal government have classified as hot zones, red zones, if you like, where there is still a lot of transmission, where more than 10% of the cases are coming in positive. We're seeing a lot in the South and a lot in the West, and that certainly is going to affect what's happening. We also got initially initial weekly jobless claims this morning, showing that more Americans are applying for unemployment benefits for the second straight week. And if you look at the effect on the workforce, I just love the fact of the matter. It's just that it's amazing when they sit there and say, well, the economy's terrible. Yes. And why is it terrible? Well, it's because of the coronavirus. Um, so it has nothing to do with the simple fact of the matter. It's just that, oh, I don't know, maybe that we just have a problem not taking care of the uh, middle and lower classes first, but we keep on taking care of the upper classes and businesses and corporations. Just a guess. And it's amazing they talk about jobless claims because, uh, well, there's news on that, too. $600 a week formally expires today. And what will replace those benefits is still to be determined. Congress is deadlocked on a potential new stimulus plan. Senior congressional correspondent Mary Bruce is in Washington with the latest. Mary, good morning. Diane, good morning. Well, overnight, another round of talks failed to make any progress. Emerging from that meeting, the White House chief of staff said he is not optimistic that anyone relying on these benefits will see relief anytime soon. Now, late yesterday, Senate Republicans and Mitch McConnell made a last minute attempt to try and extend these payments, but at just $200. Democrats want them to continue at the full $600, and they called the Republican move a stunt. They say it was a politically callous attempt by Republicans after failing for weeks to come around a more comprehensive plan. The bottom line here, these benefits for 30 million Americans are expiring. The last checks have already gone out and there is no deal in sight to replace them. Diane. All right. Agree. Now let's think about that for a second. The jobless benefits they're actually talking about was the $600 that you were getting on top of your unemployment. That actually expired as of today. Not only has that expired, um, the moratoriums on rent and other things have also expired as well. So eviction notices and things of that nature have already begun to start going out. So it is amazing to me at this point that, again, 
politicians are the most richest people next to celebrities and athletes. They don't get a thing to worry about. And I've been saying this. It is amazing to me how a politician can still be paid for doing their job and at the same time they have poor work performance enough to the point to where nobody sits there and says, "Why? what are we paying you for? You're not doing exactly what you're supposed to do. You're just occupying a seat. So again, it's amazing to me now that you're looking at this and all you can sit there and say is, why in the blue are we even paying you? Or why are you even serving us? Especially Mitch McConnell, let's be honest. Kentucky, Kentucky, Kentucky. I cannot stress this enough. You have a job in November. Please get rid of him. Uh, for the simple fact of the matter is, he's the richest senator in the entire Congress. And yet your state next to Mississippi is one of the poorest states. And it's a red state, which again, it shouldn't be, which again, shouldn't be surprising. Um, but aside from that, it's just amazing now that, of course, a lot of people are about to be really hit by that. The economy is only going to turn worse because people can't work because of the virus. And at the same time, $600 is not enough. I keep saying what Bernie Sanders has been saying since the beginning of this pandemic. We should have been doing what Canada is doing. Canada is basically paying, paying their people $2,000 a month until the pandemic is over. That's what will get us by. $600, uh, $600 is nice. Uh, but $1,200 every once in a while, which by the way, they're working on a second stimulus payment check and guess you're going to get another $1,200 because they think that $1,200 is just going to be enough to float you through all your bills during this time, which is amazing to me. But again, we shouldn't be surprised because like I said, it's, it's, it's the fact that America, it's the fact that you just have a, you have a Congress out there that will gladly pay corporations and Wall Street and everybody else all the money they want, including the Pentagon, which got another $70 billion that it doesn't need, because it's amazing to me that no one's going to point out that the Pentagon cannot account for $1.2 trillion that was spent over the last two decades. Think about this for a second. The military branch of the U.S. has spent $1.2 trillion over 20 years, and they cannot account for it. And we just gave them $70 billion more. It's like that rich college kid that always blows his money but comes back and asks for more every weekend. And yet we keep giving it to him. Um, but again, not surprised by that. Uh, but also uh, with Dorito, and for all those that for all those never watched the show before, I call Trump Dorito because honestly he looks like an overblown silver sun tan potato chip, um, tortilla chip. And since he's about as orange as they get, I can't call him Cheeto, so I might as well call him Dorito. So for all those that don't know what I'm talking about. So Dorito decided to say something um, interesting, and we shouldn't be surprised come elections because he needs the presidential seat more than anybody. Hopefully it plays. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> this, is, this is funny. Okay, I think it's going to play now. I hope it plays now. President Trump has openly floated an idea uh, that has never happened in this country's history. That is, delaying the presidential election, when, of course, his own term is up to your vote. It didn't happen during the Civil War, didn't happen during World War II or World War I. In a tweet this morning, he wrote, with universal mail-in voting, not absentee voting, which is good, 2020 will be the most inaccurate and fraudulent election in history. By the way, he makes that on no factual basis. He makes that charge. It will be a great embarrassment to the USA. Delay the election until people can properly, securely, and safely vote. That, in a string of tweets, hundreds of them throughout his presidency, is a remarkable thing for a sitting U.S. president to say and suggest, particularly as his public support is dropping and the economy is suffering. CNN's Joe Jackson. So, yes. Um, sorry about that, guys. I get the big, you know, CNN doesn't want to work with us today. So pretty much what they're pretty much saying in this one, if you haven't already seen before, Trump has sat there and has suggested that we push back on, um, he goes, he goes that we push back on, <laughs> how can I put this in so many ways, that we push back on delaying the election. And the reason why, the reason why 
is because he is citing male voter fraud. You know, that's the, that's the conservative's talking point. The conservative's talking point is always, well, what about male voter fraud? There, people can just, the votes can be manipulated. The votes can be counted. The votes can be anything of the sort aside from what they're, excuse me, anything from the side from sort of what they're there for. And so I find it funny that, you know, Dorito actually talks about, um, how can I put this in so many ways? Dorito talks honestly about uh, his whole idea of just mail-in voting being a problem, which in this case, it's not really a problem considering back in 2004 when he was voting for, when he was voting in that election, he couldn't even feel it, he couldn't even do the voting process at the time. If anything, he kind of just, um, how can I put this in so many ways, uh, failed miserably, and the way we know he failed miserably Watch this. A threat, as Chris and I just talked about, to delay the November election, which he has absolutely no legal authority to do, and which members of his very own party promptly just shot it right down. And he followed that threat by throwing around baseless charges that the election will be rigged. Is the net effect of what you tweeted this morning and what you're talking about now to cast doubt on the results of the November 3rd election? Well, it's had an interesting impact. Uh, I didn't know it was going to be the impact it had. What people are now looking at is, am I right? But not me. Are all these stories right about the fact that these elections will be fraudulent, they'll be fixed, they'll be rigged? Hmm. The President of the United States, who took an oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution is now trying to delegitimize our most democratic act? But I also don't want to have to wait for three months and then find out that the ballots are all missing and the election doesn't mean anything. That's what's going to happen, Steve. That's common sense. And everyone knows it. Smart people know it. Stupid people may not know it. And some people don't want to talk about it, but they know it. And no, we want to have a, an election where people actually go in and what's your name? My name is so-and-so. Boom, you signed the book like I've been doing for years. <laughs> Stupid people may not know it. Do you heard what he said, okay? But they're doing what he has been doing for years, right? Listen to me, everybody, okay? Pay attention. The fact is, this president voted absentee in New York in 2018 and in Florida's March primary. He also listed the wrong birthplace on a 2017 absentee ballot for New York mayor. That according to an, an, according to an analyst by the analysis, I should say, by the Washington Post, okay? And as for the president's claim that he has been signing the book and voting in person for years, I said, to, uh, watch, okay? I want you to watch this. It is from a 2004 Access Hollywood video. Donald Trump turned away from one New York polling place after another, finally filling out, guess what, an absentee ballot. Here it is. Oh, why? Do I have to go to a different place, actually? Yeah. There's a little drama at the, at the polling booth. We like Do that. Do me a favor. We double the, check. We have the paperwork. Double check. Okay. Let me see what's I'm that. calling my lawyer right Look, now. Go ahead. Right. Work on it. Good. What Wherever you want us to go, where do we go? To 520. 520 Park Avenue. Okay, yeah. I like that location better. Hi, right, folks. How you doing? Make sure there's no cheating here, right? They don't have any reason. You believe me? They don't have it in this book. He's not in, he's not in my book either. All right, so it's not here, right? Hi, fellas. How are you? You have my name here? If his name is not on these rolls, there will be a huge combustion in here. Well, I'm going to fill out the absentee bill. And I've just voted. At least you can say the Trumpster doesn't give up. That's right. Right? <laughs> Y'all. <laughs> it, it, wow. Uh, first and foremost, wow. Uh, I'd give it to Woke Don Lemon. Woke Don Lemon, I'll give you this. There's not too many segments I agree with you on, but man, you you can laugh at this one. And I like the video where it's, you know, where, again, this is Dorito talking about absentee voting, 
um, being a problem. And you just saw in the video, this was, that was 2004. The man didn't know his polling place, got mad about it, and then wanted to argue with the pollsters about where he's supposed to go. In the meantime, he wants to sit there and say that absentee, absentee voting is going to be a terrible idea. Look, I have been saying this. Others have been saying this. There, the way we vote needs to change. It does. I mean, there's nothing wrong with absentee voting, mail-in voting, especially with coronavirus and everything happening out there right now. There's nothing wrong with making the election holiday a federal holiday, as it needs to be, because folks have to decide either to go to work or to go vote or try to vote at the end of the day, because there needs to be expanding on polling places. There needs to be different ways of voting. I keep bringing up smartphone apps. Why in the world are we not looking into smartphone apps for voting? Until actually, I mean, you can vote. I mean, you can vote for American Idol on your phone. Why not vote for your president or vote for your or primary things of that nature? Why are we not looking into other areas of expanding our technology in order to make it easier for everybody to vote? Same way with Puerto Rico. Why are we not making Puerto Rico? Why are we not helping other other U.S. territories make it easier for them to vote? Why are we not looking into inmates? Which again, Florida did do the right thing a while back and sat there and said inmates who have paid their debts to society can now vote. But now it's amended because the Santos sat there and said, "Wait a minute! If you owe somebody money, you need to pay that first, and then you can vote." That is nothing more than a polling tax, which again made legal, which is terrible. So again, I keep saying this, guys, with elections, there are so many ways elections can be better. They choose not to make it that way. They choose to make it worse because it benefits them. Prove me wrong. That's all I'm saying. But speaking of things that are proven wrong, um, Dorito has a new doctor. And, well, let's just be honest. I'll just play the video. Personally treated over 350 patients with COVID. In a nanosecond, the video ricocheted across the internet, posted by Tea Party Patriots Action, featuring a group of doctors insisting masks don't work, but hydroxychloroquine does. You don't need masks. There is a cure. Even though the NIH and FDA insist that's not true, a presidential retweet made the video go viral, forcing Dr. Fauci to once again reiterate the hard science. Hydroxychloroquine is not effective in the treatment of coronavirus disease or COVID-19. While Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook removed the video, Congress demanded to know what took so long. It racked up 20 million views and over 100,000 comments before Facebook acted to remove it. Well, Congressman, a lot of people shared that, and we did take it down because it violates our policies. Of course, the internet is full of misinformation and conspiracy theories, from QAnon to Russian disinformation to right-wing documentaries that accuse Dr. Fauci himself of manufacturing COVID. The motive? He has a very high approval rating because he gives you clear, reliable, concise, timely, and true information. That is all of the kind of information that conspiracy theorists don't want. It is contrary to the very heart of a conspiracy theory. But frontline ER and ICU doctors say every false medical claim and conspiracy theory makes their jobs that much tougher. It takes time away from the work that we could be doing to actually save patients or create new science. And it sends the public into pandemonium. The goal to undermine and confuse Americans during the worst pandemic in 100 years. And he's not kidding. And the woman that they purchased, the woman that, uh, again, this is what a video of the woman, and you've probably seen it everywhere before it was taken down, was a woman that was sitting there saying that COVID-19, you don't need a mask because there's a cure, and that hydroxychloroquine is the cure, and how she treated like 300 people with it, and, you know, the whole thing. And then there's a whole other video of her at some type of ministry talking about um uh, getting the you know demon seeding and in, in, in immaculate conception it's a mess pretty much it's a mess but this woman was this woman's video was posted by Dorito and Dorito was touting this as saying see this is the there are doctors out there that are saying differently than like Dr. Fauci and other doctors who have come forward and was really the spotlight on this COVID-19 thing look there is no at this point there's no cure for COVID-19 okay People have people have people recover from COVID-19? Absolutely. Have people die from COVID-19? Yes. Including one one person recently. Um, which including one of one person recently that was actually at Doritos, that was actually at one of Doritos rallies. 
Presidential candidate Herman Cain has died from coronavirus after a month-long battle. The 74-year-old tested positive for the virus on June 29th, just nine days after he was photographed while not wearing a mask at President Trump's campaign rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Cain ran for the White House in 2012. He was the former CEO of Godfather's Pizza and former director of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. Cain also survived a battle with stage four colon cancer. President Trump tweeted that Herman had an incredible career and was adored by everyone that ever met him, especially me. He was a very special. Now, I'm not saying a coincidence. However, if a person that went to one of Trump's rallies unmasked and around people contracted the virus, why are we surprised? It was already said that, I mean, not to speak ill of the dead, but he was a former, he was a former cancer survivor. Um, those with immuno, immunosuppressive uh, systems, those who are more actable to get sick, women, uh, not women, uh, early uh, children and elderly people, those are all the folks that are more conditioned to get sick from this coronavirus. So, above all else, if, you, if there's anything to take from Herman Cain, like I said, didn't like the guy, but he was somebody's relative, brother, husband, all that stuff. He was special. He was. He may not. He may not have been important to me, but it was important to somebody. But again, the lesson we should take from that and the whole thing with the coronavirus, as it stands, is just that wear a mask, still do social distancing, go out only if you need to, try to avoid large crowds. It's not that freaking hard, people. But it's amazing to me, and I already hear it now. Well, I can't wear a mask because of this. Well, I can't wear a mask because of that. It's amazing to me that the most simplest thing that can be done has reached so much opposition from individuals for no other reason aside from the fact that they just simply don't want to. Or much like system or more like systemic racism, COVID's not gonna hit you until it actually gets until it actually hits home. Just being honest with you. But again, um with again as we move forward, uh McConnell, I should say Moscow Mitch, um, as they get close to elections, um, with the GOP right now, um, the Republicans are having a little bit of a problem. massive emergency coronavirus relief bill, the fight isn't Republican versus Democrat. I asked my Republican colleagues, what in the hell are we doing? For now, it's Republicans against themselves. A raucous closed-door Senate Republican lunch on Tuesday laying bare a series of divides between President Trump and the GOP. There are some differences of opinion uh, on the question of the payroll tax cut and whether that's the best way to go. And between Senate Republicans and Senate Republicans. A number of senators at lunch get up and say, well, well, gosh, we need we need 20 billion for this. We need 100 billion for this. And they're just really eager to spend. And I'm like, what are you guys doing? Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell attempting to thread the needle over internal concerns about spending and the White House push on a series of priorities Republicans simply don't back. The legislation that I've begun to sketch out is neither another CARES Act to float the entire economy nor a typical stimulus bill for a nation that's ready to get back to normal. Our country is in a complex middle ground between those two things. Republicans planning a $1 trillion proposal with $105 billion for schools, but rejecting the idea of explicitly tying all those funds to reopening, a key Trump ask. Another round of stimulus checks to Americans, but wary of Trump's push for a payroll tax cut. A push to increase funds for state grants to increase testing, and new money for the CDC and NIH. Despite the administration's insistence, there is still money available and more isn't necessary. And as millions of Americans face losing $600 in federal unemployment benefits at the end of this month, the biggest unanswered question, how to restructure the program amid GOP opposition. McConnell, however, making clear his conference and the White House will unify. I'm going to introduce a bill in the next few days that is a starting place that enjoys fairly significant support among Republican senators, probably not everyone. For Democratic leaders unified behind their own $3 trillion proposal passed by the House in May, a waiting game. The time is so important, and the sooner we can see. Well, here's the problem with the GDP, uh, with the GOP, honestly. Um, the fact that you're fighting an election front, election year, and a lot of you guys actually hitched your wagons to hitch your wagons to Dorito. And especially if the speed, especially the states that they represent, 
we actually want to change. There might actually be, uh, for the first time in about uh, eight years, for the first time in about eight years, you might actually have a Democratic-controlled House of Representatives and a Democratic-controlled Senate and possibly a, Demi a Democratic president, which means that, you know, the Dems can actually have the House for have the House and the Senate and the presidency for four years. And let's see what they do with it. Now, again, this is all possible. Um, but pretty much McCall pretty much Moscow Mitch or Turtle Mitch, or depending on which one, depending on which nickname you go by, is pretty much saying, look, if you got to do whatever you got to do to win your election, even if it means you have to split from the current president. And that kind of says a lot, because I used to say a long time ago that Republicans did one thing and one thing well, everybody towed the party line. And it's amazing to now to where how long is that going to last? Because let's be honest, politicians love their jobs. And uh, Dorito, he needs his presidency right now because that is the only thing keeping every wolf, every keeping all the wolves at bay right now. Um, but speaking on the other side, Democratic of the Democratic side, we get to see old man Biden, and old man Biden is still on his VP search. I thought for a second Kamala Harris was one of the choices he's going to make. I thought that was a terrible choice because Kamala Harris really doesn't stand on anything. I mean anything. It's uh, it's almost like Kamala Harris and Cory Booker are really just two sides of the same coin. Um, but he did actually, but another person that actually came up on his list, uh, Karen Bass of the, uh, Black Caucus, um, had some interesting things about what she would say if she was picked as VP. Tender to become Joe Biden's vice presidential nominee. Are you ready to be president on day one? <laughs> well, well, first of all, you know, I'm not going to get into, into that specifically, but let me just tell you that I want to do whatever the vice president needs if he calls on me to do, if he wants me to go out and, and safely walk precincts, I would be happy to do that. I am so concerned about where our country is at at this point in time. We have had a president that has just torn us apart, and I'm willing to serve my country in whatever way I am called upon to serve my country. En enthusiasm for Joe Biden is much less than it is for, for President Trump among, among supporters, among people who are intend to vote for that person. Um, and criminal justice reform is a big, important issue for you and has yes. been for years. How do you rally people in your district to support uh, Joe Biden, who backed uh, the, and wrote the 1994 crime bill and has said a number of things uh, that people in the black community, people in the progressive community find upsetting? Oh, I, I don't have a problem with that at all. I was very involved in the crime bill from the opposite perspective many, many years ago, and I understand very well why elected officials did what they did, because the masses of the people in these communities were demanding it. I thought there was another way to go. I think people understand that now, and I'm confident in the direction that Joe Biden would pursue. I know what the policies are in terms of criminal justice reform that have been put forward by the Unity Task Force that just mm -hmm. finished. You know, there was the Biden-Sanders Task Force. There's Joe Biden's policies that he had before the task force. So I know that criminal justice reform is going to be a major part of his administration. Now, I get that. Now, I do get what Karen Bass is saying. A lot of what she said actually made very much sense. Keep in mind, uh, she is the chairwoman of the Congressional Black Caucus, and she does honestly have a lot to bring to the table. Now, um, with that also being said, uh, it's going to be a tough swing. I mean, give me, don't get me wrong. Look, the problem with the 94 crime bill, this keeps getting beat up. This, keeps, this gets brought up all the time. The 94 crime bill was the one bill that Bill Clinton actually did in his presidency in which honestly created the prison pipeline that we now know today. It actually crashed, it actually led to the creation of corporately owned prisons, um, which used to have state contracts. Not a lot of them do anymore. Um, unfortunately, CCA in Nashville still does. Um, the whole thing about the crime bill, it introduced the three strikes rule, actually included harder time for, for sentences and things of that nature. The problem with the crime bill is that it basically gave the prosecution, law enforcement, uh, really a goal pass to enforce and arrest as many people as they wanted to, and the court system became the fast food of all jurisdiction and sentencing. But needless to say, it was honestly a crime bill that Democrats and Republicans both supported across the board. Now, why is that keep being brought up? Because the simple fact of the matter is, it's just that some, and, I, and I'm stressing this very heavily, some people look 
at Joe Biden and immediately think he go he voted for the crime bill. Okay, well you might as well go after Bill Clinton, you might as well go after Karen Bass, you might as well go after uh, really a, a lot of older senators that are still old senators and representatives that are still in the House and still in the Senate that actually voted for the crime bill. Actually, as I'm thinking about it, um, I want to say it was a almost unanimous. I think maybe less than 24 people voted against the crime bill, and everybody else voted for it. So needless to say that, you know, just because Joe Biden showed his support behind a crime bill does not take away from the fact that he could still be a viable candidate, which at this point, again, this is, this is, this is almost like the Hillary Trump, this is like the Hillary Trump choice all over again. It should not be lesser of two evils. I still sit, I still sit there and say to this day, Hillary was the obvious choice better than Trump. She's already served. She served as secretary of state. She served as a, as a senator. She served as a first lady. She's got more experience in the White House in her first four years than Trump does in anything. But yet, yet, what do they do? They threw Benghazi at her. They threw the fact of conspiracy theories at her. The FBI, James Comey at the time, got involved. It was enough mud in the water to where it disenfranchised a whole bunch of people from simply not being voting. And let's be honest, that is the only reason Trump won, because a lot of people didn't vote. So fast forward to this. So fast forward to what we're going to be looking forward to in November. Um, at this point, it is going to be Biden versus Trump. We need to stop looking at lesser two evils. Biden has served as a senator. He has served as a prosecutor. He has served as a vice president on two terms. At this point, at this point, almost anybody's better than Trump, and Biden might as well be that choice. Saying what he said about the crime bill doesn't really help me. It's what he's going to do forward as far as having to go back and clean up four years of what Trump has done to the economy. Because imagine, imagine this thing, that a black president took eight years to build it up, a white man took four years to tear it down. Says a lot, doesn't it? Um, but moving right along, guys, uh, the uh, Michael Brown case was reinvestigated and, uh, well, this news was reported as of yesterday. Significant, significant moments in St. Louis's history. The question for this office was a simple one. Could we prove beyond a reasonable doubt that when Darren Wilson shot Michael Brown, he committed murder or manslaughter under Missouri law? After an independent and in-depth review of the evidence, we cannot prove that he did. Out of respect for Michael Brown and, his, and for his family, I do not intend to relitigate the evidence in this case. These facts have been aired in public time and again, and this is a time for us to reflect on Michael's life, to support Michael's family, and to honor a transformative movement that will forever be linked to his name. My heart breaks for Michael's father, Michael Brown Sr., and his mother, Leslie McSpadden. I know this is not the result they were looking for and that their pain will continue forever. I also want to be clear that our investigation does not exonerate Darren Wilson. The question of whether we can prove a case at trial is different than clearing him of any and all wrongdoing. There are so many points at which Darren Wilson could have handled the situation differently, and if he had, Michael Brown might still be alive. But that is not the question before us. The only question is whether we can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that a crime occurred. The answer to that question is no. And I would violate my ethical duties if I nonetheless brought charges. Okay, so I have a little problem with that. Um, because you reinvestigated the case of Darren Wills who killed Michael Brown. Uh, who, uh, killed Michael Brown. Here's the problem with this. The simple fact of the matter is that you sat there and said that there's not enough evidence to move to prove it forward to bring it to a case for litigation. However, you sat there and said there was also multiple times that Darren Wilson could have actually handled it differently and Michael Brown could have possibly still been alive. Okay, so if you're not convicting this person, but you're not exonerating them either, what exactly are you saying? Because you got to keep in mind, he doesn't say the word accidental. He doesn't sit there and say a fall, uh, you know, a lack of judgment. He doesn't say an unjustified action. He is very careful about what he says because simple fact of the matter is, he is giving some. This is this is literally giving nothing to substance. This is him just pretty much just sitting there saying, "Well, we don't have enough to take him to court to prove it." Um, was Michael Brown armed? 
did he not kill him? Did he always say what every cop says in that certain situation? I fear for my life because he, he because according to Darren Wilson, um, his testimony that Michael Brown was reaching for his gun. Now let me ask you something, question, folks. Now I don't I don't know too many black men that would be brave enough to reach for an officer's weapon because that would give the officer every where every justified right in the world to sit there and say I fear for my life because he reached for his gun. As 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 far as far reaching as that sounds, I've never see, I've never seen anybody sit there and say, "Yeah, I did reach for his gun." No, I just I it it's hard to believe that. Even so much far as the, it's even so much farther than sitting there saying that we cannot prosecute Darren Wilson, but we can't exonerate him either. Wouldn't that mean there's an area of guilt that you can test in the court in the law? Isn't that an area of guilt where you can't test in the court of law? I don't think they wanted to. I think, I'll be honest with you, I think they wanted to protect the police. There's just no other answer. There is no other logical explanation except the fact that you wanted to protect the officer. Why? Because very few cases, and I mean very few, an officer has actually done time for killing an unarmed black man. I mean, Amber Geiger, 10 years. Um, Amber Geiger, 10 years, was another officer, I can't think of his name right now, that shot a kid in the back when he was running. He got less than he got less than nine years, and that's just two, two out of what eight cases, eight nine, uh, damn eleven cases, two k two out of eleven cases that we know where the officer was tried and charged, um, and was charged for the crime. Now at the same time, was it bullshit about the time they were given? Yes, absolutely, nine years, nine years, ten years, for for killing somebody unarmed. It should be more than that. But again, with Darren Wilson, who obviously killed Michael Brown, will not be charged by the prosecutors of the state. At the same time, you guys then say, well, my heart bracelet is not the answer I wanted, but let me also be clear, it doesn't exonerate him. That's not a justified answer. That just tells us off the bat that actually at this point, the prosecution and law enforcement will pretty much have this gentleman's agreement. Because if there's anything the police don't like, they don't like being policed by anybody else but the police. Even more so, which I still don't get, because the the evidence in there says otherwise. He murdered him. Just like in this case of this story, which a long time ago, if anybody doesn't remember, a Brooklyn man was uh, was actually stabbing a 57-year-old black woman in New York and was sitting there calling her all sorts of racial slurs. He just got sentenced for that. 10 years in prison, and it was a hate crime. 10 years in prison for that man there for, you know, randomly stabbing a black woman, calling her every name under the book, and stabbed her to where she died from her injuries, and he pretty much got 10 years. Again, I I just, how is it that, you know, you can do one and do the other? Even more so, even more so where it's so crazy about this, that everybody remembers the Boston bomber? Remember the Boston Marathon bombers, the brothers? that his sentence was going to be overturned. Uh, Doskar Tanesit, I never could have pronounced that, but y'all remember the kid because they decided to go with the most uh, Instagram, non-filtered face impossible. Um, remember him? Him and his brother that actually took those pressure cu- pressure cooker bombs and actually bombed the Boston Marathon, bombed, bombed, bombed the Boston Marathon. And again, the funny part, the, the real, I won't even say funny, the most serious part about this is they vacated the death sentence, and the reason why was that <laughs> they believed that there was prejudice toward the brother. Prejudice. Let, let's, let's keep this in mind, folks. These bombs killed and maimed and injured hundreds of people. And the federal appeals court, who looked over the death sentence, because he was given the death penalty, and they turned around and sat there and said, well, we think that, you know, he wasn't, um, <laughs> it, it was like, well, I'm sorry what they said. I, I read, I'll read quote unquote. The quote, the appeal judges ruled that the U.S. District Court Judge uh, George O'Toole, who saw Ternes' trial, fell short of his promise to question jurors thoroughly enough to identify the degree to which they have been exposed to the facts of the case through media coverage, providing sufficient grounds to vacate his death sentences. Let me get this straight. An appeals court said that the judge who ruled over the case sat there and said he failed to do what was necessary in order to ensure that the jurors got all the information they needed. 
So at this point, I again, I don't get that. I don't get why in the world, because in my mind, that's domestic terrorism. You set up a bomb killing American lives, that's terrorism. In the same sense of you wearing a KKK hood and trying to hang black people, you are a terrorist. You are a domestic terrorist. But it makes no sense at this point that right now, Ternesi, that, that kid um, is going to still be in federal prison. It's like, well, he'll be there for the remainder of his life. Oh, so he's going to be fed and taken care of off our tax dollars when we had no one. He was sentenced to death, and yet he's still here. Figure that one out. Um, also, things of figuring out is that I have to give it to Asheville, North Carolina about reparations um, because I'm just going to play a little bit of field, but not a lot of it. Because Asheville, North Carolina was the first city to actually approve reparations for black people. And um, let's just say this is how the city's taking it. The historic milestone this month is Asheville, North Carolina became the very first city in the South and only the second in the nation to formally approve financial restitution for black residents. Tonight, we take a closer look at what the so-called reparations would actually mean and ask, could the city be a, possibly a model for the rest of the country? Here's ABC's Devin Dwyer. In the heart of the Blue Ridge Mountains, Asheville, North Carolina is a bohemian retreat. It's become a bit of a mecca for people to gather that uh, have a more you know, liberal sensibility. The city's arts and architecture scene drawing tourists from all over the country. We have a very diverse culture here to where it's not like any other county that's near here. Its unique history also reflected in a shrouded monument towering above downtown. A granite obelisk erected for a local Confederate leader and slave owner, now a symbol of racial justice and demands for change. Where this monument is used to be uh, the market where they would trade slaves at. Just before the Civil War, public records show 283 white residents in Asheville owned more than 1,900 slaves. Asheville native Rob Thomas says the time has come for reparations. A lot of people say, well, you know, slavery, I wasn't around, you wasn't around. Okay, but what about how we have been systematically uh, oppressed and our economic floor destroyed nationwide through different go government programs, policies, procedures, predatory lending, redlining, blockbusting. I mean, the list goes on. Asheville City Council this month voted to remove the monument and to formally apologize for the history it represents. Do we have a motion uh, to adopt the resolution? A reparations resolution which passed unanimously promises financial restitution for slavery and decades of discrimination that followed. A lot of people just think reparations is about writing a check, and that's not what this is about. The city council says a commission will develop plans to promote black home ownership and business opportunities, but the amount of investment is still unclear. What we have committed to do in this resolution is invest in and create systems and programs and structures that will allow those community members to have the same opportunities uh, for economic mobility, to build generational wealth. And see, I have to stop it right there. The reason why I have to stop it right there is because the first thing they always sit there and say is, well, what reparations is, is it's not about cutting checks. Um, yeah, it is. <laughs> because, again, I, I love the fact they said, okay, we're going to develop, you know, in the systems in order to be toward geared toward minorities, urban development, things of that nature. You're saying, you're saying corporate buzzwords. No, cut the check. Here's the thing. It is amazing. It is amazing to me how in the world you're going to sit there and say, okay, we're going to do reparations. And I'm like, for a lot of people, it's like cut the check. You've cut the check toward every other ethnic group out there that has actually had that. They got checks cut it. There was no, um, there was no organizations to help them. Or there was no coalitions. There was no bridge work. There was none. There, there was cutting checks. Cutting checks. Simple, simple and plain. The fact of the matter is, Asheville, um, I like the fact that a lot of it that you guys are doing is great, but the problem is you're going the wrong way by reparations, and I get it. I expect that from some white people. I expect some white people to sit there and say, so they should just get paid? Well, who do we know? Who do we know? Who know who's slaves and who's not? Again, it's that it, it, this is a deterrent. This is a deterrent. When you can just simply sit there and say, I'm sorry. How many of you guys have had? How many of you guys have had a 400-year head start based off your ancestors? Raise your hands. I doubt very many black people are going to raise their hands. 
But at the same time, if you told every black person, have you ever felt have you ever felt discriminated from your job or discriminated from anything else in life simply because of the color of your skin? Raise your hands. I'm almost certain it'd be unanimous. So, um, like I said, I like the idea what Asheville's doing, but when it comes down to it, cut the check. It's that simple. And if you don't believe the fact of the matter that, you know, black people still don't run to certain things like this, there was another video that went out there this week that, again, I like the fact of the matter of when people sit there and say they're not racist. Um, this was in Harrison, Arkansas, that a director, um, <clears throat> that a video, a video photographer decided to do an experiment in uh, Harrison, Arkansas, and this is what, in Harrison, Arkansas, and this is what happened. Harrison, Arkansas is the most racist town in the United States. Have a little pride in the race, brother! Watch pride for the I want to say after dark, man. Honestly, dude, you have balls of steel because you could get hospitalized by some guys that want to beat your ass. I've had several old men come by here, look out the window and tell me, he says, you better go tell that nigger to get out of here. He's good. About 10 minutes, I'm going to be back. You better be fucking gone. Okay, come back. We're white man We matter too. And you're a white man. Crazy. You're a dumbass motherfucker, you dumb shit. Are you a Marxist? Communist. Domestic terrorist. Why don't you take it to Chicago or New York and hold it up before they're shooting each other? Explain to me why I couldn't fly fast. Get a real fucking job. I'm Jesus. Get out of town. That shit don't make shit here. Hey, all lives matter, not just black. Because I'm, I'm tired of seeing this right here is the biggest hoax there ever was. It's just the next thing to ask. It, it is. But yeah, this, black lives do matter, but what about ours, man? Uh, apparently, black people's lives matter more than us. Apparently. You know, the Irish have to Hey, Mike. How's your day going? Walmart. They put out this statement. I'm going to ask you to leave. Exactly what I'm saying is, is exactly what they would ask me to do. Just makes you want to go vacation in Harrison, Arkansas, doesn't it? Um, that was actually a video that was, uh, I can't remember that guy's name, um, because he's actually the same guy that did the video, uh, Rob Bliss, there we go, there we go, Rob Bliss is his name, um, where he actually did the video of the girl that walked through New York City, um, and she was getting catcalled and all that stuff, he's the same director for that. He was actually this, he figured that he wanted to hold up a sign and just show that racism is alive and well. Even though he is a white guy holding a Black Lives Matter sign in the considered the uh, headquarters of the KKK, so it's amazing to me that after that story came out, a lot of people were sitting there saying, "Oh no, Harrison, Harrison, Arkansas isn't like this, really." I guarantee, because I live in Nashville, you don't think that I would put up a sign that says Black Lives Matter? I would go stand on freaking Music City uh, on Broadway, the most popular spot in Nashville, one of the most popular spots. I will literally sit on Broadway holding a Black Lives Matter sign. I will guarantee above all else, I will get the exact same reactions. Because they just, I mean, people don't want to admit they're racist. They'll sit there and say everything else on the sun, but they won't admit that they're racist. And Harrison in Harrison, Arkansas is a prime example of that. But I'm pretty sure those people in Arkansas that watch this show are going to be like, not all of us like this, really? It's amazing the one woman said, fuck black lives, and yes, I have black friends. <laughs> I, I, lady, I'm almost certain you don't got black friends, because they sat there and saw that and recognized you. Your number of black friends just became zero, or your ass got whooped, one of the two. Um, but moving right along, guys, there's last story before we get to our feel-good news segment, um, which I thought this was probably the most asinine story this week that I've seen. 
where a teenage girl was jailed. At, and, I, and I admit this. When I first saw the headline for this, teenage girl jailed after not doing her homework, um, I was like, we're putting people in jail because of their homework? And I admit, the title itself is a little misleading. Um, what actually wound up happening is a 15-year-old uh, was put in jail by a judge uh, because the judge um, had said that she believed, based off evidence, that the girl was a, was a danger to her mother. And so the thing about this was she was basing this all on previous information. The girl did have a record with juvenile, with juvenile, with uh, being a juvie that, you know, her mom has called multiple times the police on her for threat, for, for, uh, violence and things of that nature and made threats. Um, but in this case, the reason, and the judge knew all this, but then the 15 year old wasn't doing her homework. And then that's when the judge figured, okay, yes, you are a threat to your mom. Yes. You're doing all these, you're doing everything else in the sun but you didn't do your homework, we're going to go ahead and put you in jail. Now, that's the point I have a problem with. Like I said, the story of the headlines is a little misleading because it doesn't sit there and say um, not doing her homework is what got her in jail, but the fact that this judge figured that this 15-year-old girl needed to be put in jail because of her homework. Not because of the fact that she had previous history in which um, she did never since she was with back her mother, but now it's along the lines of, oh, well, you didn't do your homework and you got this and you got that. It's in jail. At that point, what are we teaching? We're teaching the simple fact of the matter is just that that it's the whole prison. It's all this whole prison pipeline to prison thing all over again is that, you know, if you, you know, you get in trouble enough times, you get sent to jail. And at the same time, what is a 15 year old going to learn except to be institutionalized? And to sit there and say, well, I'm going to wind up going here anyway, so why not? Which, thankfully, a three-judge panel did actually look at that and sit there and say, oh, this is terrible, this is wrong. We order her immediate release and, you know, back in the custody of her mother. If anybody should be investigated for an internal inquiry, it should be the judge that decided just because she didn't do her homework, um, that was the straw that broke the camel's back that told her that told her to send to jail. That's the person that needs to be looked into. But anyway, that's all the stories we got, guys. We're just going to get into our feel-good news segment. Um, like I usually say on How the Frack We Got Here, we do cover a lot of stories about doom and gloom. Sometimes good, sometimes bad, sometimes it just bring you down. But it's the weekend. We want to make things great. We want to leave you on a good note, uh, hopefully wherever you are, because I know in Tennessee it's kind of a, it's kind of a wet spot right now because of the rain. Um, but anyway, we just want to get some feel-good news stories. This first story I'm going to say, though, is kind of interesting because... This involves a Rubik's Cube, where this gentle, where this young man right here, who actually holds the Guinness World Record for the fastest time in solving a Rubik's Cube on a pogo stick um, at 16.7 uh, seconds, he actually has created a website to where he can actually teach people how to solve a Rubik's Cube in under three minutes. And I love the fact that even though he's getting donations, there, even though it's free, he is getting donations that are going to the CDC and No Kid Hungry. Now, the reason why I like this story is only because of the fact this kid's doing this kid is actually doing his talent to actually help the world. But I don't know about y'all. I'm gonna I'm 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 go ahead and confess. I've never solved a Rubik's cube. I've had many of them in my life. I, I used to have one on my desk when I get stressed out, and I'll be sitting there the whole time just trying to rack it and figure it out correctly. To this day, I have never figured out a Rubik's cube. And so I see a kid, a kid who's 14 years old can solve it in less than 17 seconds. Cool. And that made me kind of go, I want to go to a dollar store or go to a Spencer's or go on Amazon and buy another Rubik's Cube and try it again. Sure, it is a mind bender. Sure, it knocks out stress. But if a kid on a pogo stick can solve it in less than 18, 17 seconds, then doggone it, I should be able to do it too. Um, just not on a pogo stick. I'm, I'm still trying to bring my weight down. I'm way too big to be on a pogo stick. Um, beyond that, guys, the other story I have here is kind of a tearjerker. Um, about a couple who's overcame um, COVID-19, cancer, and chemotherapy, and they're just celebrating 46 years of marriage. Um, the husband left actually with the one that actually contracted uh, coronavirus. He wasn't feeling well. He was having you know, sweats and things of that nature. He was encouraged by his son to go ahead and go get checked out, which he tested positive for coronavirus. At the same time, his wife, who, uh, who has, she has, has cancer, was going through chemotherapy at the time, and... Uh, 
even though he is, even though he was recovering, they did have a short time with them being apart with her starting her chemotherapy, her chemotherapy for breast cancer. He was still recovering from uh, coronavirus. They still made the point to be to be in contact, to be in touch with each other, support each other, love each other, and to the point now to where she's now in remission, and of course now he's uh, he's actually uh, uh, clear. He's actually a negative after surviving the coronavirus, in which they've now just now celebrated their 46th year of marriage. Now, I don't know about y'all, but if you can make it to 40 years of marriage, and if you can make it through coronavirus, uh, chemotherapy, and everything else, damn, you can make it. 40 years? I mean, I'm not talking about that Will and Jada shit. You can have your entanglements. But 40 years of marriage, and you faced and you faced coronavirus, and you faced cancer, and you faced chemo, and y'all both uh, y'all still together? Shoot, that that that's rare, man. That's all I can say. That's rare. But kudos to them on their 46 years of marriage. Uh, hope one day I'll be getting there. Um, but the last story I got, guys, um, uh, fellas. I know we're getting to the point to where. Falls, well, ooh, I can't wait for fall. We still got a few, we still got a few weeks of spring, but oh god, I cannot wait for fall. I cannot wait for colder temperatures. This hair is 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 detrimental to me in the summer, but in the winter, woo, it is a godsend. But again, guys, if you are one of those ones that are doing those fall proposals, um, I'm not saying this is a good idea. I'm not saying this is a bad idea. I'm just saying make sure you got your make sure you got your letters right. That's all I'm saying. Love this one. All right. A birthday celebration in Atlanta turned into a whole lot more thanks to a cleverly rigged version of the, that game called uh, Taboo. Taboo. You know okay. the game. Okay, yeah. here we go. Players <laughs> have to get their teammates to guess the words printed on the, the cards. Christina Hopkins didn't know, but her boyfriend, Donta Bell, had stacked the deck so four special words would come up. Yeah, will you marry me? <laughs> <laughs> okay, it took a couple of minutes, seconds for Christina to realize that Dante was serious. Another friend was in on the scheme. They got it all set up while Christina was in the kitchen just getting the food ready. <laughs> oh, oh, that's better than a yes. That's a jump up and down. Oh my yes. God, that is beautiful. Now that's a good that. That's yeah, a good that. that is cute. Okay. No, I admit, that is cute, but at the same time, you use tab. I mean, and I gotta give it to him. It's slightly creative that you use taboo to turn around and actually come up with the words, will you marry me? And the look on her face was like, oh, you, it was, <laughs> the look on her face was like, will you marry me? Oh, boy, still not as deep. She's like, oh, shit, you actually meant that shit. Oh, oh, damn. And of course, every every woman has a different reaction. Now, I'm sorry, if a woman is jumping up and that, call me crazy, but if a woman is jumping up and down and not saying yes, that means she has been, I'm not saying she has been waiting, but there has been planning in her head. That's all I'm saying. But again, um, you gotta love marriage proposals that are creative and whatnot. Um, at that point, like I said, being that it was taboo, it could have went horribly, horribly wrong. Thank God it wasn't Cards Against Humanity. Um, but that being said, guys, that's really all the stuff I have for this week. I do thank you, everybody, for watching. Um, before I do get started, before I do get out of here, let me just get some promotional things out of the way. There's a cash app above my head. Just lets me know that all anything that proceeds that go by will actually help just make the show better as far as lighting, equipment, things of that nature. If you can't donate, that is more than that is more than fine. The only thing I do ask is that, you know, you tell people about the show, about the podcast that I do, and probably link them to the link them to my webpage and let them know things I'm trying to do. Because like I said, um, when I first started this podcast, it is not about trying to persuade, it is not trying to change your way of thinking. My goal with how the frack we got here is to do what old news story, old news story, old news uh, stations used to do, which is just inform. I give you all the facts, and I pretty much leave it out there for you to make up your own mind about, and hopefully encourage you to do the same as far as just not taking everything at face value and going out there and just trying to find the truth for yourself, but doing do valid sources, not conspiracy theorists, not right wing or left wing, but just honestly the story and the facts, because that's what's missing out in this world. Um, now, before I do get out of here, I do want to do some other shameless plugging. I am not the only cat that has podcasts. I'll start with my buddy, BigBZA. A BigBZA. Uh, on all social medias. He has uh, the VSTs, the, uh, the Intercast, which is a news podcast that news can be music, video games, or trailers, similar to mine, because my buddy Vaughn is the king of finding the weirdest trailers out there. You only you earned that title, sir. He also has Rhythmness, where you can remember some of the rhythm in which we are due for one Vaughn, in which he has albums that he goes over and likes to talk about, you know, whether they're good. 
whether they're bad or they're really bad, because trust me, we'll tell you if it's really bad. Um, but likes to be able to have conversations over that as well. He also has Random as Fuck, which is the pool of ratchets we sometimes are pretend to, to take a break from life and have a chuckle. Those videos are usually tied to a theme. So depending on the theme, they could be funny videos, they could be some, you know, WTF videos, but there also could be some there also be some videos that always stick with you. But again, again all of his shows can be found under his Facebook page at A Big B Z A dot or all the social medias including uh internet, including Twitch, Instagram, and uh Twitter. I think he's on Twitter. I think he is. Mother Bun from Different Mother Thomas Reed, a.k.a. The Mountain, Bunch, uh, Mountain uh, Puncher, is also uh, doing his own thing with To Be Determined Podcast, which is a Q&A live Q&A Facebook question from the gym every Thursday. Why? Because the man works out every day. But he loves to talk about fitness and loves to actually bring other people into the conversation and be able to provide advice on how to help you. Because if you've seen Thomas Reed on Facebook, trust me, the man is definitely fit. Um, aside from that, guys, I do have my own podcast, like I said before, every every Tuesday from 7 to 9. It's my Burned Out Podcast, which is my IT storytelling podcast in which I tell stories from my actual experience in IT, always ready to a theme. I try to make it informative as well as funny. Um, also, every Saturday, as you can see from 10 a.m. to noon, is the How the Frack We Got Here podcast. A little bit later tonight, between 7 and 9 p.m., will be the Off Limits podcast, in which, like I said, with that podcast, we definitely do go there. As in go there, I mean, we do talk about the things that nobody wants to talk about in order to actually, in order to generate that conversation. Um, of course, Sunday, between 7 and 9 p.m. as well, will be my Get Bit podcast, which is my Blurred podcast, in which I cover things from video games to comics to science to sci-fi to television shows to movies and things of that nature, and even sports, even though right now sports might be at a standstill again, but we even cover everything, including wrestling, because for some of us, it's still real to us. Um, with that being said, all of my shows can be found on my Facebook at William Buchanan, as you're watching now, or if you're on Facebook or on YouTube, you'll be able to follow up my shows that way, which on either site, if you just look up The Burned Out Podcast, if you look up How the Frack We Got Out, How the Frack We Got Here, The Optimist Podcast, and Get Bit, that is G-I-T-B-I-T, you'll be able to see every podcast that I've done in its entirety. So if you like what I did, please let me know. If you didn't like what I did, please let me know. Like I said, I'm just trying to make this program better and platform better for everybody to enjoy and to be informed. That's the whole idea of this whole thing. Because an informed community make a lot about it. because an informed community can make a lot better decisions than an uninformed one because an uninformed woman got a strump and that's how the frack we got here. I do want to thank everybody for watching. Hope you have a good weekend. Please, oh please, stay safe when it comes to this coronavirus. Wear a mask. There is no there. I mean, we try the other way. Wear a mask. At the same time. Um, avoid large crowds if you can. Go out only if you need to. Protect yourself. If you feel sick, don't go out there and spread what you already have. It's just that simple, folks. Aside from that, thank you all for watching. I am out uh, until uh, off limits there on the night. Hope everyone has a good one. Peace.